I'd like to introduce our first set of speakers, Matt Mullenweg and Matthias Ventura. Matt is the co-founder of the open source blogging platform WordPress, the most popular publishing platform on the web, and the founder and CEO of Automatic, the company behind WordPress.com, WooCommerce, and Jetpack. Matthias is an engineer and designer from Montevideo, member of the developer experience team at Automatic, and the lead architect of the Gutenberg project in WordPress. Today they will take us through what to expect in the future iterations of the block editor and how you can better prepare for upcoming releases. Matt, Matthias, take it away. Well, hello, hello. Um, I'm really glad to uh, be here with you today. As um, Mark just mentioned, my name is Matt Mullenweg, co-founder of WordPress, lead developer, and um, I've been really looking forward to this. Now, it's been definitely a strange time to be in the world, and it's uh, exciting to come together for a day virtually uh, to talk about what I think is one of the most exciting things happening on the web right now. It's, uh, of course, bittersweet that we're not able to get together in person, but it reminded me actually of the very first days of WordPress, when WordPress itself, 17 years ago, uh, was started um, by folks who had never met each other. Mike Little, myself, Alex, Ryan, like we had actually never met. We coordinated purely online. And so this kind of brings us back to that. Uh, I'd like to start by just reiterating the four phases of Gutenberg. So we are in the midst of a very long-term project that is the largest reimagining of WordPress really since it started. We call it Gutenberg internally, externally we might call it the block editor of things. But when we introduced it, I talked about that there was going to be four phases of how the project would roll out. The first phase was going to be WordPress or Gutenberg for changing your post and page content. So think of that as the editing phase. The second phase is going to be all about customization. So that's taking breaking outside of the box of the post and page content and editing your entire sites. Uh, navigation blocks, widgets, uh, full site editing might be things people think about there. Phase three is all around collaboration and editing. So imagine real time collaboration, something closer to like a Google Docs or a Notion. And then finally, phase four will be all about multilingual. WordPress is a global community, a global product, and we want to exist natively in a multilingual world. So make it as easy as it is to make a single poster page, to make a beautiful multilingual site. So to give you a sense of where we are, we are uh, about two years into phase one. So we have launched and had a lot of success so far with the block editing paradigm. Blocks have allowed people to see not just WordPress, but the web through a different lens where you can look at a page and sort of imagine the blocks that went into making that. Uh, but we're not done with phase one, as you might see with um, WordPress 5.4, which just came out, uh, which had, was it 10 major Gutenberg releases in it, Matthias? That's correct, yeah. 150 contributors and 1,200 pull requests. Oh my goodness. A lot of that was aimed at making the editing experience better, whether it's reducing the milliseconds of every keystroke, making Gutenberg work with Moby Dick length <laughs> post and other super long ones that we use to test the performance and continue to provide a standardized framework for all other plugins to integrate it, be it SEO plugins, editor plugins, or the now more than 2000 blocks that we think are out in the wild. Yeah. Gutenberg is not the first software of its type to attempt what it's doing, but I do believe it's the first that's doing it through a community and uh, standards-based way. So what we're trying to do with Gutenberg is not just make another block editor or another page editor, but really provide a common framework which every single plugin, theme, extension, agency, everyone who works in the WordPress ecosystem can have a similar way to do things, almost like a standard set of railway tracks that they can build beautiful and unique experiences on top of. So we've had a lot going on. Um, talked about the four phases, the 2000 blocks, and you know, as with all of these, 
the most exciting part is always the demo. So or the master of demos here, Matthias. <laughs> Are you ready yes. to, to take it away? I am. We're doing all of these live, so there might be hiccups. Hopefully <laughs> not. Um, I first wanted to say that one thing I, I really like about 5.4 is that um, there's a lot more features coming in into the editor, but at the same time, performance is getting better. And I think that's a, a very remarkable thing to, to point out from the from the team. So I like before the I jump in, getting simpler in some ways too, which is pretty yeah. special. Like as we, you know, just like editing, you know, we write the first draft. We've now had, gosh, how many public iterations of Gutenberg? <laughs> <laughs> 60 releases, 70 releases? I, it's we're in 7.8 7 version, so 78. We're going to the 79 now. So 78 public releases, and each one yeah. uh, refines it. And sometimes yes. we take two steps forward, sometimes we take one step back, but it's always continuously improving. I think that's also something yeah. important for people to remember for Gutenberg is that you know, there's a lot of feedback on the first version and said, oh, it's not ready. And we're like, no, it's not ready. <laughs> we, we have so many more things we want to do to improve it, and that's been the past couple of years of work. Cool. OK, so before I get started on this, um, I think it's safe to say that we can scratch like a bit more than half of this customization phase. And I'm going to dive a bit into where we are at now. OK, so. The, the the first thing to, I want to touch a bit on some features that launch in 5.4 um, before diving into what's next. Um, one of those is, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, is this inline color feature, which was requested a lot by users. Uh, so this shipped in 5.4. Um, and one very nice detail that I always like to mention is that uh, the same way we added like, uh, link boundaries, we call them, like in, that was before 5.0. Uh, this also works with that. So when you get to the edge of something like this and you press the back arrow once, you escape the color, but the carrot is still next to it. So that allows you to know exactly where you are when you're modifying this. So I think that's a nice little detail that it applies to everything, every inline control that we have, um, including inline code, um, bold, italics, all of those. Okay, so it's it's been a long road for Gutenberg since we started with the initial UI. So I want to I want to touch upon something that's brewing now. We just merged it into the plugin uh, right after the 5.4 um, sort of deadline, so that we have a full release cycle to refine and make sure things are up to snatch. But this is this redesign focus um, on many. Uh, fundamental areas that we couldn't get to um, when we first started with Gutenberg. Um, the main thing is when the, in the initial versions of Gutenberg, the first design, uh, which is this toolbar that you can see here, um, I'm going to zoom a little bit. So this first toolbar, we did it before we had nested blocks, before we had columns, before we had all these complex interactions to handle. Um, so that's that's something that we wanted to improve. Um, it's come to, it's become very clear that there's a lot of uh, interface that can get in the way of the um, a smooth writing flow. So the, the new toolbar uh, focuses on a few principles. It attempts to reduce and clarify the main interactions. Um, it improves the contrast. It makes targets bigger for mobile and the web. Um, it also uh, absorbs the movers, so you get the um, the up and down arrows um, tied to the block type instead of like floating around. And it also handles contextual tools a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to browse through this a bit. And one one thing that's uh, another little detail. Let me see if I can focus on this. Is that um, right now, there's no block outline around the block. Uh, and this was a very deliberate um, choice to make sure the writing experience is smooth. But it's also important to know the block boundaries. Um, so we can, right now, when, you, um, when you're in this mode, um, you can 
quickly switch to this. Um, we call it the navigation mode. Um, I'm going to do it a couple of times so that it's perceived. Um, and the idea is that when you're in navigation mode, you can just quickly browse through all your blogs. Uh, you zoom out so that you can see better. And it just tells you which block you're in. Um, this allows, especially for accessibility, it's a, a quick way to browse through um, and enter post. At the same time, we also added that when you hover over the block type, um, we highlight the boundaries. Um, so there's a lot of these small details that, and again, this is not, this is just the initial design up that they were doing. It's going to continue to be refined. Um, and it also works with, let me do like keyboard. So if I'm navigating through the toolbar with my keyboard, when I get to the block type, that's also, and it's retained when you are in the, um, when you get to the block movers. Okay. So that's that covers a bit of the toolbar, which is the main, probably the most significant, the one that you will see the most. Um, another thing we did was uh, make the inserter much more prominent. Um, it's come up in a lot of user testing um, that people tend to miss this button over here uh, because it just looked like the, all the other interface elements in the header. So this is a way to emphasize that there's one interface for inserting things and everything, especially as we get into things like block patterns and template areas and all of those, um, we, need, we need to ensure that we point users in the right direction. Um, there are some things that are still uh, up to refine. Um, one that I care a lot about is uh, drag and drop. Um, these are these two videos uh, sort of give show the some of the ideas that we're playing with um, for sort of lifting the blog when you're trying to drop, um, making sure that it's clear that you can do that. Um, and there's a lot here to continue to refine. Another thing that I really like uh, is the, the placeholders, and we continue to refine them. Um, here, it's showing the, the block cover, um, and the cover block is super powerful now. It allows you to embed a background video, background image, add overlays. Um, it supports gradients now, so let me just... And, and what we added to the placeholder is this quick way to just get it started with some color. So I'm going to pick something and gradient and so let's pick a gradient and there's also um i think one realization that came up through all these years is that both the toolbar and the block canvas are probably the most important elements that we have so we're we're adding a lot more of these direct manipulations so that you can change the size of the gradient you know what the yeah, gradient the reminded cover. me of? Yeah. Do you remember Kubrick, the theme? Exactly, yes. <laughs> and when we did the gradient there, we actually had to create a PHP script to create an image. And so it was like direct image manipulation of colors in PHP. And now it's, it's so it's, much infinitely easier. It's all coming back as well. <laughs> <laughs> So and and here's a this is not this is not even in the plugin yet, but I wanted to show it. It's a really cool feature on the cover block, um, which lets you basically align using this grid um, the main contents of the gradient. So you can, and it also works with keyboard. I'm going to just move with a, so you can just choose whatever you want to place this, uh, and I really love this interaction. Um, it's also like the detail that the icon actually shows the. Let me zoom in. The icon actually shows the current position. So if you are on, on the left, the icon shows it there on the left. I think this is um, combined with patterns that's coming along. I think this is going to allow a, a lot of very interesting things. Um, and of course, I want to emphasize that this sort of design refinement is an ongoing process. We have a full release cycle now to um, sort of fine tune these these aspects, ensure that we continue to test and gather feedback. Um, but I'm quite happy where it's um, at right now. Okay. Do you recommend people use the Gutenberg plugin in between releases to stay kind of current with the latest? Um, I I am running it on my site. Um, 
Me too. It's uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, it come uh, every I don't know. I would say that we we have a lot of testing infrastructure around it to ensure that it's always as stable as possible. But there can always be like some rough edges, especially with these things that uh, will take I don't know like a few releases to get into like a really nice place. You might be experiencing some of these rough edges. Uh, but hopefully it's like it's minimal and, and nothing that actually breaks flows. Um, I'd encourage anyone who's learning uh, product development or UI design, it's really interesting to see how some of these features develop over several versions. Um, it's like being able to watch an artist early in the canvas and not just see the finished product. So if that is something you're into, it, um, I'd recommend checking out the Gutenberg plugin and staying up on that. Okay, I'm going to jump with one of our biggest projects now, which is this full site editing thing. Um, and there's a lot going on here. So I'm going to start um, first sort of like um, giving some context of what full site editing is, is that Gutenberg so far has focused on the uh, content area of posts and pages. What full site editing does is expand that scope to uh, basically every aspect of your site. Um, that includes everything your theme does. Um, all the theme hierarchy, so talking about like archive pages, single pages, um, the, all, all of those templates, the 404 template, all of those aspects are absorbed into this uh, system. So I'm going to show here, and this UI is not final by any means. Um, but just to show, we have this sort of template selector here. And I'm working right now on the home template. Um, but you can see, hopefully, that I have a few others. Um, that was too much. I have a few others, like a single template, a page, archives. Um, and there's a few things going on here. Um, first, we have instrumented a way for the user can say modifications to templates. So right now, the archive and the index, which don't have this blue dot, uh, these are coming from a theme. Um, but the ones that have a blue dot are ones that I've customized. So it says customized there. And this exists in my site. Um, so that means they are saving a custom post type. So that means you get, um, you, you get a lot of benefits. Because if you were to switch themes, there's the possibility of like you can retain your modifications to the header and apply it to the new theme. Uh, but also you get things for free, like revisions um, per template, um, which is pretty neat. In WordPress, you get everything for free. Exactly. <laughs> so, and here I'm, I'm just showing these sort of small previews are done on the fly. They actually render the actual, all the blocks that are contained in each of these uh, pages. Um, so you can get these live previews as you move through them. And it also applies to the actual template parts, which is a template parts are we we call them block areas, but it's essentially the same as the um, the concept that already exists right now in themes. So if you want to make a template part for the content or um, the header.php is already a template part in a way. So right right now I'm on the home. Uh, I'm on the home, and I want to show what this things like these template areas are, uh, which everything is blocks. It's like it's blocks all the way down. So if I check on this tool, like the block navigation, um, I have this header container here, which has all this complex structure inside, including a site title block, a navigation block. So we're, we're starting to have all these pieces um, done in a single editor. Um, one thing I'm, I'm really happy that the, the team managed to, to make it work. Uh, is the fact that it feels like a single, um, like you're just editing a single sheet of paper, right? Like you can even navigate between the keyboard between all the elements and it feels like it's a single thing. But it's actually, everything is very structured. So you have these template parts um, that can actually be saved separately. So I'm going to make some changes here, say, um, I don't know, my site. So if I, I'm changing the site title here, which is inside a header template part, and if I were to go and update the design, um, I can see here, the update, that it's, there's a bunch of things that have been modified. This index template is because I modified it before. Um, 
So here I, I made changes to my site title, to my home template. So this is, again, not, not necessarily the final UI, but it's allowing us to sort of refine the, make sure that all the pieces are in the right places. Um, so, and talking about Kubrick, like we have this, um, again, I'm using a cover here for the, uh, so let's do like, So this is basically my header, and and since it's a cover block, I can also use the. Let's apply some overlay gradients to this, and increase the opacity. And of course, this new tool. I really love this one. So you can like find a nice alignment. Um, also, like we have the focal point picker. I don't know if people know it, it allows you to reposition the image. So here I'm just, again, editing the header for the homepage template and using the same sort of block tools. That's, that's probably one of the most um, important aspects here of bringing the block interface everywhere is that it brings that sort of familiarity and, and, and I can combine any, any blocks within. Um, I think it's also worth noting that, you know, we're designing for multiple devices all the time now. And yes. one of the cool things about Gutenberg is allowing you to switch between what it looks like on a desktop, on a tablet, on a phone, just yes. through the whole process. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to that. We don't have it enabled here yet for the full site editing view, um, but it's, um, it's a very important part that also that all the blocks are designed with that in mindset, which comes into play, especially with patterns because mm -hmm. you can add patterns and know that they are already responsive by default. Um, and that's pretty cool. So the other thing I wanted to show is that since everything here is blocks, I'm dealing with columns. Um, I can add, um, let me, oh, I don't know, like the comments I need to add here. So I don't know, like the this is another new block on the, 5.4, the social icons. You can add like, I'll add my, and let me add a Tumblr one. I believe your Tumblr is automat. So you can, again, you can basically add widgets to the, to the cybers like, and everything is integrated. Um, and you'll be able to also like create template parts on the fly. If you say like you want to make this like, again, a reusable template part, uh, that's going to be very easy to do as well. The The other thing I wanted to show here with the, the site title thing is that um, you can add the block multiple times and it will always be, um, it would always be uh, synchronized. Um, so that's also, Again, it's the same block in both places. So if I just reverse to these, it will be fine everywhere. And again, with updating the design, I can still see the templates that I've touched upon. The other one that's a, a new block coming is the navigation block. Uh, this, is a, this is a very complex, uh, there's a lot of complexities inside this block that have allowed us to sort of refine the, the block system for everyone. Um, we place a lot of effort in ensuring that there's no like ad hoc uh, sort of solutions just for this block and that we can ensure things are applied across the board. So one of them is um, like every item inside the navigation. So let's change, I don't know, this is my home uh, to, or let's change. So these items, um, they show up here. Um, these are actually child blocks. So it, each menu element is a block in itself and it has its own tools. So if you want to create a sub menu, um, but it also, it's reflected here uh, and it, it doesn't show up with the block name, which would be like menu item. It actually takes one of the block attributes, um, zoom this in. So it actually shows home to, it actually reflects the full hierarchy with the correct names. This was done in a way that any block author can use these systems. And there's a lot of talks coming in the conference that will touch upon a lot of these APIs. 
Um, but I think it's very important that we consume this in the same way and we ensure we put effort into, uh, because it just opens up so many doors for blocks to be a lot more both powerful and intuitive to use. And every other block editor I've ever used, navigating that hierarchy is one of the most frustrating things. Yes. And it's kind of a, it's a UI problem as well across many different concepts in WordPress. So, and to reiterate something that as we go through Gutenberg, we're going to be able to simplify so many different concepts in WordPress that previously, like if you edited something here, it was different than if you edited here, et cetera. And um, that flattening of WordPress, I think will make it much more accessible to a much, much wider audience because you can learn a concept once and then know how to do it everywhere, every time, yeah. in any plugin, in any theme, everywhere in WordPress. Yeah. I, th I think that that comes really to fruition with the full set editing experience because the, like, it, sort of ev everything just works the same way. Um, another one I wanted to show is these horizontal movers. So we have this concept of sort of a nested block area where all the blocks are laid out horizontally. Um, and that allows us to switch the movers to just be horizontal so that you can just swap this out. And again, this is done in a way that um, any block author can use them for their own blocks. Uh, it actually also works for um, these items here. So if I want to put the tweet first. So again, it's the same sort of interactions applied uh, across the board. Uh, we need to, we haven't done it yet, but we want to apply it to galleries as well. So that it's not, right now these are within the, and you don't get the nice sort of motion either when you when you move them, um, because they are not child blocks. So this is a good example of, of why child blocks are so important. Even, um, even if you don't want to make, um, because some of the concerns that people have with using child blocks is that, well, all of a sudden you have all these very granular sort of and, and toolbars floating around. Um, but it's important to know that we can absorb a lot of those sort of design issues. Um, here, for example, in the navigation block, uh, it's not moving the toolbar when I switch between the child blocks, because there's, again, another setting that says, oh, for this enter navigation block, I want to absorb all the toolbar controls in the same place. So even though they change contextually, right now I'm selecting just the navigation block. And if I select a child, it shows the settings for the child, but it stays in position. Um, even if I were to align this to the right, um, it stays in the same place. So all the uh, child elements, this is, this is an option. This is not, in the case of this, like you can see that the toolbar jumps with each item. These are things that are still like, we need to figure out exactly when it's useful, when it's not, when it gets in the way and when it can be refined. But it's all done like coherently in a way that also benefits uh, the block ecosystem. Okay, I think this cover the main things here for this page. I want to switch to some of these other because the same way that this preview loads dynamically on the fly, you can also switch to them like instantly. So right now I'm editing the single page, uh, and this is low, this is the, this hello world is not a real post. This is just placeholder content. But each block, this is the um, let's open this. This is the post title block. This is the post date. This is the content. So I can reorder this when I'm working on the template and ensure this is sort of this is how every post that I make is going to look. Um, and again, this the header area is the same. So. I thought if I change something here, like the title is also in all these templates updated. Um, we're going to be like a cool thing would be to actually be able to load um, a real post as a context here. So I want to see how my latest post looks, how my, I don't know, like a feature post that I might have. Um, but this is all working with these templates. So it's, um, and again, my page template can look entirely different. Um, Let me close this. And uh, well, and finally, like this, whenever this detects that there's a template part, it shows it separately. So I can, if I just want to focus on my title and navigation, um, I can have a view just for that. Um, and this can be, I think this could be like pretty useful for even like larger websites where you might have like editors that can focus on um, very specific things or, um, 
I don't know, even permissions, it could be done to that level. So this sort of granularity um, is, is very powerful. And that's not something that we want to, just want to be very clear about that. That's, we don't want to lose that sort of flexibility out, that comes from having well-defined structures while still attaining the, the experience of feeling like you can edit everything at once. Okay, any any questions so far about this full set editing? Otherwise, I would like to move to. How long do you think the full side editing phase of this work uh, will take? I so I like to say that we'll have it um, in a very decent state in a in a couple months, um, mm -hmm. and that means that. Again, like we need a lot like themers to uh, start testing it like and give feedback. There are already uh, considerations to handle about translations and dynamic content and dealing with the loop and those kind of things um, that need refinement. Um, but I think the, again, I feel like the biggest technical hurdles have been overcome. So there's a lot of work now left in polishing the experience um, making sure we build enough themes with this to see if it's flexible enough, if it handles all the needs. Um, mm. So I, I think the target we have, I believe, is for uh, 5.6, so towards the end of the year. Um, but ideally, like by mid-year, we have it in a state where we say, okay, this is, um, this is good enough, and we have a long period of testing, refining, and feedback loops, um, because there's a lot going on into this sort of... It sounds like one of the better ways for people to contribute would be to try to build themes or sites using this. Is that fair? Yep. I and agree. if you do, yeah. you get special attention from the Gutenberg team because <laughs> you'll be one of the first. Yes. <laughs> and I think that I think the theme group has set up like um, a GitHub called Theme Experiments, where they already have a few of these sort of block-based themes. Um, and so that's also a good place for the community to, to submit like new experiments and new themes and collaborate together there. Great. OK. I'm going to, well, how are we with time? OK. I want to show this last one, which is, um, I'm super happy about this stuff, which is the block patterns. Um, and we have, a, we have a sort of like an initial UI now here um, for block patterns. This is, again, this is not going to be the final. The idea is to integrate this with the main block inserter. Um, but sort of to give an idea of what patterns are, um, patterns are basically groups of blocks um, that have a, either a layout-oriented mindset or a design-oriented mindset, and, and they make these combinations easy for users. Because as we were seeing in the previous screen with the site editor, the structure can get really complex between columns and all the nested blocks. So it's still like, no matter how easy we make the editor itself, achieving sort of this interesting layout is going to be tricky. Um, so let me add a bunch of these patterns here, like two text columns, like more intricate grid systems. We have the notifications popping up. When you add them, I'm going to just add a bunch. Uh, this is just for all sake, a callback to our last <laughs> demo. And I'm, I'm just adding them like one, one after the other. Um, let me see what else. Oh, we also have things like, again, right now it's like eventually we'll need like proper categorization and organize things based on layout, text, structure, stuff like that. But even simple things like images side by side is not, is not the most, we always have it as one of those things to test. Um, it's how easy it is to get two images to sit side, side by side. Um, and it's not the most, uh, e e like it's hard to get to that, to know like, oh, should I use a gallery? Should I just, uh, so this kind of things already shows you how to, how to achieve some of these effects. I've been thinking a lot about how to teach people columns because yeah. it's so powerful. Yeah. Okay, let me close this. Yeah, I, I have something else to show for columns here. But I want to see, so the other thing is that all of these are, of course, every element is done with blocks. So if you want to, I don't know, make changes, like everything is um, 
And there's the, we don't have like full snap to grid yet, but it goes through intervals, so it's easier to align things. And and of course move them. Like buttons is another one that again talking about the block APIs, it uses the same, so you get these horizontal movers again for the buttons. Again, even but even these sort of sort of to to your point about columns, even these sort of layouts are not immediately easy to do. Um, so it's I, one thing we have. Let me clear this. And and again, this this layer which seems very like intricate is really just if you inspect how it's done, it's just it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful, and, and that compresses down nicely, right? Yes. So let me, I'm going to delete all of these and add, let's add, for example, the columns, these, and I don't know how this one will handle, but let's see. Yeah, so it, when you are on nice. mobile, like things would always, and again, the two columns of, task, of text will just stack vertically. And this is in the plugin now, or will be in the next release, right? The preview is in the plugin. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so uh, you can get, and patterns are also on the plugins. Uh, we also added in the very last version, we added ways for themes and plugins to register their own, because we still, I think patterns are one of those, we've always said like blocks should not be, like themes should not create blocks. Um, but at the same time, patterns I think are, are more on that. Like I can see themes where, because it goes back to the, the usual problem of the demo site, um, yeah. where, I don't know, you, ha you have these sort of units of design that are not easy to replicate. So a theme could register some of these as patterns. So a user can replicate them anywhere. Um, and I think we're running a bit over time. That's okay, because patterns are pretty much the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> patterns are gonna yes. be one of my highlights of 2020. Yeah, and th this I I also like this is a nice detail, but we tested a lot this sort of how how to lead users to edit images, um, but this sort of replace thing is a lot more clear. So when you add patterns, you get this replace, and you can open your media library or drag an image into the pattern and change it. So again, make it very easy to to update those things. Um, Okay, I think that's about it for the demo. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Yes, we've got Q&A now. Just talking about live demos, that was uh that that went off without a hitch. So, thank you for that. <laughs> so, I'm I'm glad. I'm <laughs> glad. So, we've got a first question here from Scott Clark in the chat asks, is standardization a priority for Gutenberg yet? Specifically, registering more of the block configuration within PHP, such as block panel settings, which currently require you to build custom JS for each. Hmm. What do you think there? That's a good question. So th th there's a few layers to, to that question, I think. Um, we're really trying to make a block API that sort of optimizes for what we think are the most uh, important experiences in block editing. That's one of the issues with the PHP APIs is that it would be simple to sort of map them into, um, I don't know, like a set of fields and settings. But as we're trying to move more of these tools into this sort of direct manipulation paradigm, it starts to become more difficult to do those things. So for example, the, the cover image, like when we are resizing the, the thing that can very easily be a field in the sidebar with an input and a pixel value. But we also want to make those things manipulated directly in the canvas. So that's why we encourage people to use the JavaScript APIs that we offer. Um, instead of like, again, trying to sort of dictate um, a set of settings from the PHP side. That said, I think there's a whole spectrum between um, the things that really need or can benefit from these direct manipulations and things that can be a bit more form driven or API driven in that sense. Um, like so easy they, mode for certain blocks, right? Yeah. And, and also like, again, this speaks also to patterns, like patterns can be registered in PHP and you don't need, again, you don't need to touch JavaScript at all, um, which I think is also 
um, it's going to this is going to be covered through the conference as well but this is it's important to i feel to be very expansive in the way that we again because a designer might have a very nice experience just creating a pattern and wanting to launch it without even touching php um, and the same PHP developers that may not want to directly interact with the JavaScript APIs, there are some things that we can do um, through templates, through the... And I think it, it might also mm. be interesting to see um, if we can map, for example, the one of the JavaScript APIs that we use all across the place is the rich text component. Mm -hmm. The rich text is the one that allows you to add any field as text. Since we have, we have absorbed so many interactions there, that's something that you could define uh, in PHP somehow. Um, in, if you if you're not the, because you're really in the end you're not really building all these controls. You're just using the Gutenberg APIs. You you don't have to yeah. manually build a lot of this. I guess that's the, that's the way I was thinking of it. That it's almost like a paradigm shift where before we might want to build a form, right? And we'd say, oh, yeah. there's going to be these text box and things like that. Um, but really, if you imagine what every single block is, it is a form field that you can make much more directly manipulatable and directly addressable in a way that feels a lot more WYSIWYG. And each one supports all the standard controls. So you don't get the yeah. thing like we had with widgets forever, where like, how do I make a link inside a text widget? Yes. You know, so everything that you do that's native to Gutenberg, you can essentially design the richest, most beautiful forms anyone's ever seen that can have images, really any element. And so yeah. when you're able to, by registering those block patterns in PHP, think of that as almost like the form builder for, for Gutenberg and now for WordPress. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a bunch of also like in the styling options that we're starting to look now, uh, it's important to standardize. Like it's very important because it will allow us to also to supply the native mobile apps where they, the more that we can speak in this sort of abstraction layer of APIs, the more that we can benefit both the web and mobile um, and, and make block building something that you can write your block specification once and you know that the mobile apps will handle it the web will handle it. That's sort of like where we're yeah. trying to go, um, but it's just one step at a time. Um, Th that's worth repeating as well, that in parallel to all of the web development happening with Gutenberg, there is an Android and iOS version being created simultaneously. Um, it's a little bit behind in some of the blocks, but like it's it's continuing at pace. So this means when you build a site for the, a client, you can set up the WordPress mobile app for them and they can make quick changes right from the phone or their iPad or wherever they are and not mess things up <laughs> because it'll all be in blocks. And that is revolutionary. Like how many times have we built like sites for clients or, or other sort of really rich, cool things, but you'd say, you have to do this on your laptop. You have to do it in Chrome. Like it's not going to work when you're on the go and the world is just, it's mobile now. So everything that's happening will be both web Android and iOS. Yeah, really nice. Our next question is from Jamie Schmid asks, are all these templates able to be locked down to further block editing once you pass pass it on to the client? This looks like a solution for page level block templates and locking, which I've been needing. Yes, so the, the locking system is something we added like very early on for the, um, the general, we had like template for custom post types uh, and we had for, if you are a block developer and you're using inner blocks, you can lock things down. It's not exposed yet for patterns, um, but that's sort of also the idea, um, which is, is, a, is a very good question because these, again, we can build all this flexibility, but there, there should always be control. Like the site owners, the themers, like everyone should have control if they want to say, Oh, I want I want to use this sort of block structure, but lock everything down. So people cannot change the columns. They may be able to replace the images, but not do anything else. All of that is definitely part of the roadmap. Some things are already possible yet. A few others need to be uh, handled in patterns slightly differently. Um, because again, when you're building patterns, you're not using the JavaScript API. So you cannot um, supply some of those attributes to lock things down. Um, but you can do it. Um, you can do it if you use the JavaScript API, and we want to open it up for the patterns as well. Thank you, Matthias. Um, I think we have time for another question here. 
And that's good, I'm back. <laughs> Can you see me again? Great. Yes. Sorry about that. I was trying to use a fancy camera and it overheated. <laughs> <laughs> my, my fans are on, on maximum speed right now, I think. I know. <laughs> Every time I do anything on video now, like it sounds like like my computer's trying to take off on a runway. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if we could get one more question in today. Jessica asks, is it really necessary to have 2,000 blocks from a developer perspective? I would prefer having fewer highly customizable core blocks rather than a huge selection that do similar things. Hmm. You know, one thing as well is that right now some things are blocks that could be patterns. And so you could see, you know, maybe we do have fewer fundamental core building blocks in the future, but maybe 10,000 or 20,000 patterns. And I would love for us to also have a standard because there are call it one or 200 kind of basic things that are on, you can build most web pages with. And so if we can almost think of a standard way of addressing those, I think that would be kind of cool to almost have like a Dewey decimal system or a taxonomy to say like, this is like an E4, you know, hero block yeah. and then people could do variations on that but you know it's in the e4 category yeah yeah i think i think there's really like a trend towards um even like a lot of the re releases in in 5.4 like also came from inspiration from code blocks or the editor's kit plugin so there's a lot of like again like um, finding out from the ecosystem what what are the sort of fundamental pieces that make sense in core make sense as part of the block API uh, and a lot of the things I talk about like with child blocks it also um, sort of relates to a lot of these things uh, because maybe like if you represent everything with child blocks maybe you do end up with um, like a, a, a large amount of blocks but again they should all be using sort of these same APIs to standardize things um, the block directory is also going to be a good tool to see, like, I don't know, maybe we coalesce into like a single slideshow block. That's really the sort of the best of all the slideshow blocks, because I feel they are already like 20 or so out there <laughs> doing the same thing. Um, well, Matt and Matthias, thank you so much for your time today. We all really thank appreciate you all so much. it. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mark. And also thank you to the, it looks like over 450 people tuned in right now. Like, this is uh, exciting to experiment with these new formats. Yep. Definitely. Y'all have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Matt.